Nevada building in downtown Selma, Tennessee at the Crossroads Change in Rural America exhibit. This exhibit is brought to us by the Smithsonian Institution's Museum on Main Street, Humanities Tennessee, and Arts in McNary. I'd also like to thank our local sponsor, Precision Assembly, and also our many volunteers, community partners, and board of directors for Arts in McNary that worked so hard to help Arts in McNary with all our programming. We have a very special treat for you today. We have Mr. Jack Martin of Hockaday Handmade Brooms. Jack is a fourth generation broom maker from here in McNary County, and we are so delighted to have him with us here today. He's going to talk to us about his craft, so let's get started. Many um, traditions to preserve the future, that's what we're talking about today. Many communities recognize that their cultural and craft traditions are also marketable assets. Visitors are attracted to the products produced by local craftspeople, artisans, and learn about the community. That's what Jack Martin does. He is a local artisan and folk life celebrity, and we are glad to have him here today. And we are gonna ask him a few questions and watch him make some brooms. We have a very special guest also with us with our Arts McNary Heritage and Cultural Committee Chair, Mr. Sean Pitts. He's gonna be talking to Jack. So if you'll just hang with us, we'll get started with that. Thanks. Hey, like Joanna said, this is Jack Martin. Uh, we're here watching him make some brooms at the Crossroads exhibit. I uh, just wanted to say uh, uh, hi to Jack, let him say hi to you. How you doing, folks? Working hard today. Uh, what you doing there, Jack? Well, I'm stitching. Uh, I'm actually stitching the broom flat. When I first make them, they all start out round, uh, kind of what you see over here. And then I take them from one machine to another and I uh, wrap them in them. Today, what I'm doing is I'm stitching. I, I'm making child's brooms today. I've got about three left that I'm trying to finish up on. So you caught me doing something today. Well, that's good, being productive. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, your, uh, how you got started doing this. Well, uh, my family, we have been farming here in McNary County since uh, right after the Civil War. And so we have been, uh, like I said, farmers. My great granddad in the wintertime couldn't make a living farming and he got the idea. There was an article shipped in the paper back around 1903. And the story of my family goes that he cut this picture out about this article and from this picture he built the equipment that I'm using and he started growing the broom corn which is a material that was uh, grown by Ben Franklin. He's the man responsible for growing and developing broom corn, made the old fashioned round broom in around 1740. Uh, show, show us what broom. a round, round broom looks like. You got one? Got one right here. Uh, and the round broom, of course, sweeps just as well as a flat broom. The only difference, a uh, flat broom covers a wider surface area, but a round broom still does a great job. This is the way Ben Franklin made them, and of course they were round. I take it from the round stage to the press, mash it flat. And that's what we're doing today. And before that, of course, we had the besom broom, which dates back before the broom corn, where our settlers would just take twigs, tie it to a stick, and that was used to brush uh, the dirt in your log cabin. Right, so uh, when, when did it start to develop uh, into the, to the, the way that you're making brooms in the press today? From the pioneers, uh, just making them with whatever they had, uh, up to uh, where you have a press and you're actually uh, making them a little bit more uh, uh, sturdy, when did that start to happen? Uh, the wrapping machine, uh, uh, the, uh, the Shakers invented the broom press, which uh, Ben Franklin, uh, around 1740 on the round broom. Around 1840, the Shakers invented the broom press to take the round broom, mash it flat, and kind of speed it up production a little bit. Uh, I also have another machine that looks like a vise that holds the broom handle in place and rotates as I wrap the broom onto the handle, which is called a wrapping table. And so those have been used since the late 1800s. And so when you see the old Westerns with the flat brooms and round brooms in the country store, you, most likely they were made on an old press or an old machine. And I'm still using the original equipment built by my great granddad. Great. What about, uh, what about the broom corn itself? You mentioned that a, a little bit. Is it, is it difficult to grow? Does it grow well uh, here? Uh, 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 the broom corn grows just like a corn plant. It's a cousin to a corn plant. You will have, uh, instead of an ear of corn growing out the side of the plant, you have one piece of broom corn that comes out the very top of the plant. I will go through, break it off, comb the seeds out, and once you comb the seeds out, you have one piece of broom corn. And for my big house broom, uh, it takes 200 plants to make one big heavy duty broom. And so that's why you can't mass produce, but broom corn is the toughest natural fiber there is for making brooms. That's why our brooms will last 
we advertise six to 10 years, but I've had customers have them 15. But broom corn is a really tough natural fiber. And once I harvest it, I literally take an old fashioned curry comb, you might say, comb the seeds out and the seeds that I'm using. Now this is last year's broom corn. I'll be combing those seeds out and planting them next week sometime. So I'm in the process of getting ready to plant my spring crop right now. How many brooms can you make uh, in, a, in a year, Jack? If I've got if I've got everything just right, I can turn out. Our joke is about ten, about a dozen a day. So in a good year, the old-fashioned big broom, about two thousand brooms, and that's that seem may sound like a lot, but when you're doing it by hand, where a motorized machine and in a, in a, today in a modern-day factory, a motorized machine, a good operator can turn out twelve dozen brooms a day. I turn out a dozen, but my quality is, uh, is just incredible. And that's what kept our business going for 103 years is strictly the quality of our broom. Right. And right. our mops, we still make a good handmade mop. What about, uh, uh, what about visitors to your shop? Do, uh, do you get a lot of visitors at the shop? Do you welcome visitors? Do you want them to come out and see what you do? Oh, I, I love that. We, we, we have a lot of home schools that still come out in a, on a small scale. And uh, I still go out and perform at different schools and a few festivals every now and then. Uh, there's a lot of great folk artists in America. You just don't get a chance to see them like you normally would because a lot of the crafts are dying out. We don't have young people taking up the crafts. And so I'm always trying to urge people to come out and see what I'm doing. And I do teach broom making. I've had many students, about, about 17 actually. But uh, you just don't think this stuff is being passed down like it used to. Blacksmithing, basket making, they're dying out of our country and these are things that every town, back in the 1800s, every town, the first thing you went to, the blacksmith, I mean, if you didn't have a blacksmith, you didn't have a town. So a lot of the crafts that built our rural America, they're, they're, they're going by. I'm, there's less than 200 broom makers left in the country, and I'm not sure how many of them are doing it as a living. This is what my family's been doing for a living uh, for many years, and so to do it by hand, uh, it's all about quality, trying to make sure, and even on a small scale, I'm looking for a repeat business, even though my cut, my brooms last for years, that's the reason people will buy more. So yeah. uh, it gets twisted around sometimes about the idea about certain things tearing up and different things, but real quality will last you for years. Yeah. How important has this tradition been in McNary County over the years? For me personally, our family being farmers and being from this community for so many years and watching the community grow and then drop down and pick up. Uh, for me personally, it's an incredible important thing to keep culture going. Uh, the farming aspect of everything. When you lose a farming family, you've lost a lot in a community. When you lose farming industry in a community, it just almost shuts things down. So, you know, everything from the small farmer market. Uh, like this year, I'm raising an extra 100 tomato plants so I have something to sell along with my brooms because things change. And so you have to be able to change with it. Small America has done a good job of adapting but sometimes it is tough to hang on in there and to pass the stuff from one generation to another when everybody's leaving for something better sometimes it's just really good to stay right here and build what you got yeah we're going to be talking about a, a community identity here in the next few weeks when we do another uh, uh segment or two in, in, in video uh can you talk about how important you think uh handcraft tradition like this is in, in terms of a community's identity, what we think about ourselves, what we say about ourselves, and how we sort of uh, promote ourselves to the rest of the world? Well, you and I know that that's one thing I'm very, I believe very strongly in, simply because my family, for years, we put on our own festival here in McNary County called the Broom Corn Festival, which was focused on nothing but true folk art, trying to get as many true artists to come out show off their craft and to get that word out in front of everybody else to show what's available in your community. If they don't know, you've got three different, this community's had as many as four or five best uh, broom making families at one time. We've got pot, two or three different pottery families in this community. We've got basket makers at the next community over. So if you don't show off what you got, nobody's gonna know. You, you don't talk about yourself, you gotta have somebody else talk about you and show you off. So we have an incredible amount of things in this community we're just not getting a chance to show them off like we need to. We, you need volunteerism. You need so many things to come together to help a small community thrive. And this community is a good community. I've, I've been here my whole life and we, we have our ups and downs, but you've got to perpetuate the crafts. That's a 
it's a vital part of the backbone of art. Uh, you know, there's fine, there are all different degrees of art. They all go together and touch and kind of bleed together. A fine art and folk art and you know, you've got to have all this stuff together. And then there's music on top of that. In this county, the music alone, Elvis was here. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just, I hate it sometimes when we just don't get a chance to brag about ourselves. And then things kind of come and go and you can't keep them going. But in this community, for me personally, our family, it's kept our family going. The folk art aspect has, I've made a living at it. I've raised my family here, great grandkids, everybody. Plus all the friends that I've known and come to, love and appreciate in this community so for me personally it's been an incredible important vital thing for me especially to have an art organization that believes in the different things that a community does now i know i'm a little you know i'm, I'm part of arts and magnaria and i'm proud to, and have been for years and i'm proud of that because i'm i'm kind of rougher kind of art and they put up with me but you've got to have an organization that's prepared to do what it takes to bring people together and to make art in the community thrive. If you have art, you're going to have a lot. You're just going to have a better place to live. What keeps you doing this, Jack? I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I love what I'm doing. I, I have had many jobs in my lifetime. I've worked for Rockwell, Texas Instruments, a lot of companies. But farming has always been my main thing. I've known from the time I was six years old, I love digging in the dirt. The broom making happened later in life. I never anticipated being a broom maker is just something I grew up around and everything. And of course, then I met my wife, Virginia, who changed my whole life. And so because of her artistic vision, we took an old idea and turned it into a halfway thriving business with some notoriety. I mean, we've gotten a few little pieces of notoriety. Our family's been- Like what, Jack? <laughs> Come on. Well, okay. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we did, of course, started out, we've been featured in almost every major newspaper and magazine in the state of Tennessee and surrounding. Uh, we demonstrated at the Olympics in 1996 through the Smithsonian, sell our brooms through the Smithsonian, so we've had some really cool things happen to us. Uh, uh, we've been, my wife, as far as the music, a lot of folks, when I get back to the music, my wife was an incredible musician, he used to tour with John Mayo and Eric Clapton, uh, did five albums with John Mayo, so she was the artist in the family. I was just kind of like the backbone, so a lot of the stuff I talk about, it was really her vision who saw different things about the broom making, so I don't want to take credit because I, all I did was show up and move the stuff around. But uh, You made we, a few brooms, too. We have, we have we spent a lifetime trying to build on an idea, and so that's still where I'm at today. Uh, a lot of stuff I'm doing, I just, I love my work. I guess that's all there is to it. I still love getting up in the morning. I never know who I'm going to talk to. I really enjoy going to my shop. I simply love my work. That's about it. You, you had a couple of awards in Tennessee, too. Oh, I, I was going to let you. You going to let it slip, was you? Uh, in 2015, uh, the pinnacle of our career, I have to admit, uh, our family was given the Governor's Folk Life and Heritage Award, which is the highest honor in your state. And, of course, uh, the folks that we were associated with, with Miss Loretta Lynn and and just uh, numerous names that you know that are out there. And so we were one of those names. And so my wife, my family, we were invited to the governor's mansion, had dinner and talked and carried on, made fools out of ourselves. My, my highlight was Miss Loretta hung on my arm all night long. I was her date. And, and I come to find out her mother was a broom maker. And so we, and, I, and so I just, one of those things that, uh, just a highlight of my life in, in more than one way. And of course, I had to ask her the obvious question about when she was 13, did she really put salt in that pie? And she said, yes, son, I did. I was 13. I didn't know salt from sugar. So anyway, but we have been very blessed as a, uh, as a family in folk art uh, to achieve a lot of awards. And people love what we're doing and care for us. And we, we truly have been very blessed. And so I'm, I'm the fourth generation, uh, my daughter and great-granddaughter and uh, uh, Everybody loves what we're doing, but I can't say they're going to carry it on, but they love what and support what I'm doing. So I'm going to do it as long as I can and show anybody that I possibly can to kind of perpetuate it. Because even if I'm, they're not doing it for me, we need to keep it going. Great. I'll tell you my favorite memory from that uh, Governor's Folk Life Heritage Award ceremony is when Loretta got up to receive her award. Uh, she said she was so proud to see a broom maker being recognized on the same night that she was because she never saw a store-bought broom until she left Butcher Holler. <laughs> and the one thing that I enjoyed that night is we're standing there talking. They're trying to take pictures of us. 
we're looking at her and the governor's tapping me on the shoulder <laughs> saying, uh, Jack, you gotta take a picture, you gotta look forward. And she's, and who am I gonna pay attention to, the governor or Miss Loretta? I'm looking at Miss Loretta, what can I tell you? I'm not listening to the governor. <laughs> That's right. But that was, a, that was a, and you were there, I mean, you know, that was just an incredible uh, thing for my wife and I, and of course, uh, uh, I just, to this day, I, I haven't felt anything that's been like that, even to this day. You got a couple of other items there that, uh, before we wrap up here, show us uh, uh, some more variations on what you can do with a little bit of broom corn or how you can make a broom uh, there. Well, uh, well, I've got uh, some of the stuff that I've got, like some of the broom corn doesn't all turn out nice and straight. Some of it is bent, so of course my wife come up with ideas, we make broom corn wreaths. So we don't waste anything when we're using a broom corn, so we broom corn wreaths. Uh, these are old-fashioned toothpicks and cake testers. My grandmother had a bundle of cake testers in the drawer to check the cake with, or she had the cake tester broom hanging up beside the stove so she could break this off and check her cake. And then, of course, she had the pot scrubbers for the cast iron skillet. So growing up, we just made stuff. It wore out, you threw it away, made you another one. You didn't really go to the town and buy stuff. Uh, small whisk broom, just something to sweep up with. Uh, this is another thing I want to talk about real quick. Uh, I'm an old drummer just like you are, and several years ago, uh, my family, uh, wife and I, we came up with an idea, of which I've been working on for a long time. These are drumsticks made out of broom corn. They take the, the place of the old-fashioned wire brush for blues and jazz, and so we have been selling them all over the world for years, and we sold them to Pro Bark for a long time, but we sell them on our own now. But uh, like I said, uh, it's just something that we've used for years and years, and again, made out of broom corn and they have a great natural sound. Clint Black, Liam Walmack, George Strait, all their drummers use Hockaday's broomsticks. So that's one thing that we're very proud of. Uh, I got one little thing I wanna show. This is a 1885 old fashioned horsehair Native American broom. I've had this for years. And so a lot of times you'd find brooms made out of everything from broom corn to horsehair to bamboo back here in the back. So just kind of showed you about the idea of brooms and brushes, the different things that we've come up with in our lifetime that you just don't want to throw away. Great. Anything else you want to say, Jack? Well, I want, I want to thank Arts and McNary. Really, y'all have been a great job in this county for pushing folk art, music, all the things that a county thrives on. People, you may not eat it, but I'm telling you, you like to get out and listen to it. So I, I just want to thank that, you know, say thanks for, the, you know, keeping it real and just trying to do the very best that we can all do. Thanks, Jack. We appreciate you. Thank you, Jack, for coming here today. We appreciate it. Thank you all for watching. Please watch um, Facebook and our YouTube channel. We will be having more videos for you to watch about the exhibit, and we'll have some other exciting guests here. Thank you, Jack Martin, again with Hawkaday Handmade Brooms. Bye, everybody.